Oh, what is that? I want it recorded. Her. Continue. All right. Um, welcome, everybody. Tonight is Thursday, October 21st, 2021. And this is the quarterly meeting of the Burlingame Historical Society at 7 p.m. And we welcome everybody. This is a great um, opportunity to learn something and to, to learn what we have in our archives. I'm Jennifer Foff, and I'm the president of the Burlingham Historical Society. I have a few housekeeping items about our program. The presentation is going to last about 40, 45 minutes, and we're going to try to keep the background sound to a minimum. So um, try to mute yourself if, if you're not speaking. Um, maybe at the end of the program, we'll deal with questions and such. And uh, you can indicate if you have a question um, for our guest, Liz Dosa, um, or anybody, you can um, enter a chat or I guess unmute yourself. Um, Tonight we're going, this program is dedicated to the memories that ordinary citizens like you and me record of events, both big and small. These memories are very important because they provide historians with rich and detailed, vivid images of what life was like in the past in a way that a recording of facts and figures and even photographs really never can. Sometimes these memories are recorded in diaries like Anne Frank's famous one, and sometimes they're recorded in letters, like the many that went back and forth between John and Abigail Adams during the founding of our country. Sometimes these memories are recorded by journalists, adding what is known as local color to their stories. Tonight, we're going to read a few of our favorite passages from memories that have been preserved in our archives. And then we're going to conclude the program with tips from our guest, Liz Doza, a certified guided autobiography instructor on how to record your own memories for your family and for the greater community. So here we go. Laughlin McLean was a landscape gardener who came from Scotland with John McLaren in the early 1870s. Newspaper woman Constance Lister recorded his impressions of early Burlingame when he was nearly 100 years old and living in his home at 30 North Delaware. I could stand at Coleman and see clear to Palo Alto. It's not a fib. There were a roadhouse or two that served mighty fine whiskey, one or two barns and a few trees. Nothing else but fields and man, how that wind would blow. Burlingame? There was no Burlingame when I landed here. Coyote Point was an island in high tide. We used to fish at the very spot where Humboldt Street now runs. When asked how long it took to drive his horse and buggy from San Francisco to Birmingham in the 1860s, McLean said with a wry smile, it depended on how many saloons were along the way. Let me think, there was McCann's at Coma, Uncle Tom's cabin at San Bruno, and 16 Mile House at Millbrae. Ed Shaver was an early resident who recorded his activities in Burlingame and San Mateo on the morning after the big San Francisco earthquake of 1906. There was lots of damage after the quake, including chimneys and brick fronts that had fallen down all along the street. Around 8 a.m., I decided to go to downtown San Mateo on my bicycle. When I reached the livery stable on the southeast corner of 2nd and B, the first man I met was Mr. Jennings, who ran the livery stable and asked for help. So I went to work clearing bricks off the streetcar tracks. The roof of the San Mateo freight shed collapsed on six tons of blasting powder for the Ocean Shore Railroad and 10 kegs of beer. Cans of milk had been delivered to the station platform by 5 a.m. that day. The men involved in clearing the area knew it would spoil if left there, and apparently no trains were running into San Francisco that day to deliver the milk. So they gave dippers full to the trainloads of people fleeing down the peninsula from San Francisco. 
The second day in the morning, we took the blasting powder in an old wagon down to a shack in the marshes away from town near the sewer outflow below Coyote Point to an area used by fishermen. That afternoon, four men from San Francisco came down in a big old sedan with written orders from the San Francisco fire chief to collect the powder. They put six boxes in place of the back seat of the car while the four men rode in the front seat and I rode on the running board back into San Mateo. The following day, more men from San Francisco arrived and took all of the remaining blasting powder. It was used in San Francisco to blow up buildings in an effort to create fire breaks to stop the fire. Historians note, no mention was made of the fate of the 10 kegs of beer. <laughs> Early pioneer James Murphy also recorded his impressions of Burlingame right after the great earthquake of 1906. Burlingame's growth may be attributed largely to San Francisco's disaster. Much of that city's population traveled southward. The early realtors were enterprising fellows. Here the people found subdivisions laid out unlike anything they had ever seen before. There were macadized streets, which is just crushed and compressed rock. The streets were planted with beautiful trees. Water pipes were laid to every lot with prices to suit the pocketbook of the humblest investor. The only fly in the ointment was Burlingame Creek, which ran along the south side of Burlingame Avenue and which had a habit about every other winter of overflowing its banks and racing like mad through the stores and the railroad station. It was not uncommon to see beer cases, cartons of crackers, cranberry barrels, and the like floating in the vicinity of Husing Block. Now the Husing Block is the first block of Burlingame Avenue going west from Burlingame uh, from California Drive by today's Lamone Restaurant. Jim Murphy went on to describe that in Burlingame's early days, the town, however, had its own Paul Revere in the person of a chap named Harry Singleton, whose abode was in a dilapidated streetcar situated in Hatch Creek along the Hatch Alley along the creek. Harry was always first to feel the approach of a flood, particularly if it occurred during the night, which it often did. He felt it was his duty to ring the fire bell and thereupon residents would start salvaging goods and belongings in the basement or gather in Burlingame Square to survey the wreck. Singleton on one occasion rescued a heavy sleeper in the person of an English dressmaker who slept in, in the rear of her shop on Burlingame Avenue. The storm waters on this night had crept almost to the top of her bed, and she slept unconscious of the swirling waters that threatened her life. When the cold water finally drenched her, she woke and let out a war whoop. Without waiting to don her clothes, she darted for safety. Singleton, who was passing, took her on his back, asking where she wanted to go, and received the reply, oh, take me to Mary England. He answered, I won't do any such thing. I'm going to drop you right off at the depot. And to the depot she went, along with the other refugees. In the 1920s, Wheaton Hale Brewer, the son of the rector at St. Paul's Church in Burlingame, captured his images of Burlingame in a book a poems called the Burlingame Ballads. This poem is simply titled Burlingame. Stillness and the cool of dew, dawn freshness over dahlia plots, roosters laughing as they see, commuters as they run cross lots, hills lovely, lovelier than Gilead, all modest fringed with trees, with scarves of fog about their crests, the Georgette of the breeze, whimsy smoke that steals aloft on highways of thin air, for Burlingame, as all men know, has good roads everywhere. Oh, Burlingame, home of my home, your eucalyptus trees like men march proudly up the county road and then march home again. Myrtle, Cookie, Otter moved to Burlingame in 1923 
when she was nine, a long-term member of the Burlingame community. Potter self-published and was titled Childhood Years in My Burlingame Paradise. She writes of her childhood in the 20s and early 30s in the Eastern Edition off Hillside Drive. Our closest shipping, shopping district was Burry Burry, later named Broadway, which boasted a small country store that housed the post office, Mrs. O'Connor's dry goods store, and a candy store run by a Mrs. Spitzer, who was well named because she really had to keep your distance when you taught when she talked. The double row of eucalyptus trees, which lined both sides of the street, was still there in 1923, but was cut down in 1925 to make room for the many businesses that demanded space during the next few years. I'd bicycle to the three stores on Burry Burry, whizzing down Hillside Drive with my dog, Buzzy, in my bike basket. He rode with his ears back and his nose high, kept all the enticing smells along the way. When we got to the stores, I'd lean my bike against one of the trunks. No need in those days to chain your vehicle to prevent its being stolen. For one thing, I'd probably be the only person in sight. My ice cream soda cost a nickel and Buzzy's cone cost three cents. Jim Murphy, who we mentioned before, as an early Burlingame pioneer and city employee, was a friend of Joe Beard the early Burlingame postmaster, Murphy recalled a challenge that he met. In the early days, there were only four mail carriers for the city of Burlingame. I used to relieve these mail carriers for their summer vacations. As a result, I guess I knew everybody in Burlingame. There was only one bad feature to that mail carrying business. They had what they called a special delivery letter and it cost 10 cents. So they paid a delivery boy eight cents for each airmail letter. Well, I'd have to be available. The last mail train that would come into the city was about seven o'clock at night. So winter, summer, rain, hail or anything, I had to be available if there was an airmail letter. And there was one son of a gun who lived on 1464 Vancouver Avenue. That's as far away as it gets. And he used to get all kinds of letters. His name was Duperu. I'll never forget his name. And I used to have to pump a bicycle up there for eight cents. No wonder I remember him. During the 1930s, Cookie Potter also remembered that children played freely in the still vacant lots in North Burlingame. I envied the boys because they had more freedom and played more daring games. For instance, they often went skinny dipping in the lakes on the Mills estate. There were three lakes. The lowest was full of goldfish. The middle was good for swimming, but the highest was the boys' favorite. They built a diving board and swam underwater. We all wandered freely over the grounds. The mansion, which Mr. Mills had named Happy House was still there. The conservatory and formal grounds were located at the northwest corner of what is today Truesdale and Ogden Drive. The mansion was on the north side of what is today Murchison Drive and was a four level second empire residence noted for its living room, gallery and grand staircase a master bedroom of Mother of the Pearl and a ladies bedroom of Ebony. Another bedroom was called the Grant Room after ex-president U.S. Grant stayed there. There were hundreds of eucalyptus trees on the grounds, some only six inches in diameter. My cousins would climb up them to a distance of about 15 feet until the tree arched over. Then they would drop to the ground. 1941, Marie Crandall Lauder, who lives at 1117 Cortez, kept a diary which was recently donated by her granddaughter, Burlingame resident Debbie Lauder Sullivan. Marie's diary not only gives her reaction to the news at Pearl Harbor, 
but also gives us a glimpse into an ordinary family's evening entertainment in the days before TV. Saturday, December 6, Harry Sorrell's birthday. They wanted us for dinner in town, but we had to chaperone the eighth grade dance at school. Up to school in the afternoon to see about arrangements. Children had done a grand job of decorating the auditorium. Sunday, December 7, Japanese bomb Honolulu. Buddy heard report over radio before we start for 2 o'clock mass. Seems incredible. Adele Columbia called from New York. What of the Lurley? Sorrels, Burns, and Mrs. Richmond here for ice cream in evening. We listen to radio newscasts all day long. Things look none too good. Monday, December 8. Worked on Anne's suit while listening to proceedings in Congress, which declares war on Japan. San Francisco has blackout. Fisher's over for bridge. We try to concentrate on game without much luck. Hope Lurleen is safe. Tuesday, December 9. Wanted to finish my Christmas shopping, but seemed to have lost interest. To Red Cross instead to roll bandages. Ernie with me. Stayed until 12.30. Home and tried to straighten things out in case of emergency. Took wool up to Helen's and discussed probable fate of Lurleen. Home and arranged for blackout. I'm Mark Lucchese and I recently retired from Molly Stones after a grocery career that spanned five decades. That would be 50 years. I started working at my parents' grocery store, Jim Super, which stood on the corner of 210 Primrose and Howard Avenue, currently lo the location of Citibank. Across the street from Jim Super on Howard Avenue was the Blue Chip Redemption Center, currently the location of Comerica Bank. Diagonally across from Jim Super was a Chevron station, which is now the Burlingame United Methodist Church parking lot. And de directly across from Jim Super was a purity market which is now Ike's Sandwiches and Five Guys Burgers. Coincidentally, at that time, next to Purity Market was also a Safeway. So we had three grocery stores in a row on Howard Avenue from Primrose to El Camino. Next door to Jim's Super, walking towards Burlingame Avenue was Arthur's Toy Town. And on the other side of Jim's, as you walk down Howard Avenue towards Park Avenue, was Primrose Lane's Bowling Alley. I had the pleasure of working for my parents at Jim Super after school while attending Sarah High School in the mid 60s. Burlingame and Hillsboro seemed much smaller then. For example, customers would phone in their grocery list. One of us would write down their list and then do the shopping for them. Deliveries were set aside until the delivery boy came into the store after school. Usually that delivery boy was me. And man, I almost always got lost in Hillsboro. Many of our sales were made on, informal, on an informal credit system. It was very primitive. The customer would sign the receipt with his name or her name and phone number. We would then tape that to the register and it would stay there until the customer paid the bill. I didn't realize it at the time I was working. It was there that I would learn about work ethic and customer service. My parents, Roy and Bruna, would often work six and seven days a week. They would always greet customers with a smile and a hello, often calling them by their first name. Roy and Bruna would always check their personal problems at the front door, and once inside the store, they would give their customers 100% attention. They would start early and finish late. My parents made me learn the, learn the skill of keeping the parking lot clean, pulling weeds, cleaning oil slicks, sweeping up cigarettes and broken glass before I was allowed to advance to the inside cleaning jobs of cleaning the meat lockers, clean check stands and back rooms. Only after I spent an entire summer mastering these jobs was I allowed to bag groceries and eventually, eventually move to the job of checker. The skills of hard work, punctuality and determination that I learned from my parents would carry with me throughout my 50 years in the grocery business, 21 years at Molly's, at Molly Stone's, just a Walgreens away from Safeway. It seems like the Lucchese family has been competing with Safeway for over 60 years. My memories of Jim Super include hard to find gourmet grocery items, a five man meat department with a wonderful selection of aged tender meat and a produce department that shine like diamonds. To this day, I remember my coworkers, Gus, Jack, 
Joe, Gary, Bill, Harold, Michael, James, Ray, and Vince, and a cast of part-time player employees, many of them my classmates at Sarah. Jim Super stood proudly on the corner for 10 years, sadly losing our late lease in 1969. My parents were outbid by first federal savings and loan, who eventually sold to Citibank. As you know, I'm Jennifer Foth, and I wrote the following at the beginning of the pandemic, knowing that this would, that would be a time to remember. A surreal, dreamlike atmosphere settled in the typically frenetic Lion and Hogue neighborhood of Burlingame. It was March 17th, 2020, one day after the Bay Area counties had issued a shelter-in-place order amid the COVID-19 virus outbreak and a week after the World Health Organization announced the worldwide pandemic. Daycares and schools closed, parks closed, religious services moved online, restaurants scrambled to offer online meals to go in order to keep their businesses running, grocery stores and some other businesses were deemed essential and permitted to operate with certain restrictions, including stringent cleansing of store, store, the store and carts, each city government would do its best to designate online workarounds so that at least some city business could take place rather than being frozen in time. Hoarding toilet paper, masks, and hand sanitizer was rampant after the health order. It was initially believed the virus could survive for long periods on most services. The term social distancing was born. Six feet apart from one another to avoid spewed virus aerosols. Pods were formed of small groups, often simply the family unit in which pod members would insulate themselves from contact with the rest of the world. But sometimes pods extended to another family outside that household to share childcare, for example. The goal of the pod was to limit the number of people with whom one socialized, thereby limiting the possibility of virus spread. Handshakes and hugs disappeared however reluctantly, almost overnight. All these extreme limitations, however, had a silver lining. For the first time in decades, people who typically spent most days stressed with obligations from morning till night had nowhere to be. They, the forced downtime would be used to play with their kids, their pets, and in some cases, in some cases for the first time in years. Kids also had nowhere to go and nowhere to be. So the laughter of children playing with their newly present parents filled the otherwise empty streets, elevated to ad hoc playgrounds nearly overnight. I hope you've enjoyed these selections from our archives and can readily see how much personal memories help create a vivid image of years gone by. But now I'd like to turn the program over to our guest, Liz Dosa. Liz is a local resident and for over 20 years has worked in communications and public relations for the Sisters of Mercy. She's taught English in both private and public high schools after graduating from Pomona College and earning a master's of arts in teaching from Harvard. She's also the author of two books, Notable Excitement, 30 Years of Music at Cole Mansion and I Am the Bread of Life. Liz now teaches free guided autobiography classes at local libraries and other locations. Liz, we're really happy you could join us tonight and we look forward to hearing any tips you have on how we can best learn to record our history in the making. Thank you so much. I enjoyed so much hearing the selections that are read so full of detail and humor and just great sense of the past. Um, the, what I'd like to talk about is the persistence of memory and how we can really aid that ourselves and in our own lives and for the community. Um, I think, you know, that guided autobiography is a really interesting tool that was just created um, by James Barron, who created the Department of Gerontology at USC. It's about a 20, 20 year old um, system and now it's gone all over the world. So I'll just talk a little bit about that particular way of approaching autobiography. And then I thought I'd then go to some hints just in case you're interested in doing something for yourself. And I do also have a list of books, which you know you, uh, I could email if you were interested. But 
the basic ideas of guided autobiography are that structure is essential in when you're approaching your writing project, especially this one. And guided autobiography doesn't use a chronological project, a chronological process. You don't start with birth or when you were five. You start with themes. And at the very beginning, um, people have make generally a, a kind of a chart of, of the important part points in their lives, we call the branching points. And that's a good way to start. And then we'll go into particular um, focuses. But so the other part of it, besides having ins insisting that there should be a structure, is that there's also a supportive community. So the people meet in groups every couple of weeks generally, or although the groups can meet every week. And the idea is that you have an assignment. And I think perhaps this is one of the most important things, uh, parts of the program, because we all know how deadlines work. They work. And if you don't have a deadline, it's very hard. You know, Why would you get up in the morning if you didn't have coffee and you have to make it or whatever? Um, everything has a, an appropriate deadline. But if you don't have one, it's easy to put this project off, especially. And as I was listening to the parts that would be the selections that were just being read, I'm thinking that guided autobiography or any kind of autobiography is another way to record the personal past, which is so important. And the selections that I heard were so, were so full of those details. I thought, I thought they were wonderful. Um, and I was, I'm gonna share with you a little selection that was in, um, that was in your newsletter. And so I won't read the whole thing, but I, Susan Orlean writes about libraries and I know some of you are on phones and you probably can't see this, so I'll just read a few of the sentences. But she's reflecting on how important it is to, to um, preserve the past, not just for the sake of preserving the past, but to connect ourselves with the past, that we're all, that we have purposes, that we have shapes in our lives. So anyway, I'll read this. You know that you are part of a larger story that has shape and purpose. This is when you, if you're writing. Uh, a tangible, familiar past and a constantly refreshed future. We are all whispering in a tin can on a string, but we are heard. So we whisper the message into the next tin can and the next string. Writing a book or an article or just one page is like building, just like building a library is an act of sheer defiance. It is a declaration that you believe in the persistence of memory. So I think that's a good thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about the importance of writing about your own life. Um, and, and the way that it's done for guided autobiography, again, is to build around themes such as your family, money, how important it has been, and it's important in everyone's life, whether we'd like to ignore it or not. Health, how it's determined a lot of your life. Your education, how it's, how it's built probably where you are. Your work, your spirituality, your goals. And as the groups go on, generally um, what happens is the groups will meet for six to eight times and go over these basic themes each time you'd have an assignment of prompts that will encourage you to write about that theme. But then more themes are created like this last class um, that's meeting tomorrow is writing about part participating in a historic event. So, you know, what do they remember? What part of history did they remember? Um, impacted them, or maybe they were a kid, you know, there are, there's, you know, as historians, um, how many possibilities there are for that. So then you would meet um, with your, with your group every couple of weeks. And the one, the important thing is that there is a lot of confidence and feeling of security sharing your writing with other people. So um, the, the, the focus is on encouragement and support, not, we're not criticizing people's writing, so they'll get it into the New York Times. Um, that's another step. Anyway, um, and so part of the other thing that we do is to is talk about ways to improve your writing. And I find um, that that happens when you write and read your own writing, but also when you hear other people's writing. Um, that really gives you ideas and, and uh, inspiration. So those are kind of the bas basics of the guided autobiography program. But then I have some basic hints I think you could use almost no matter where you are. Um, and I just, of course, need to find where this, <laughs> there we go. All right, this, um, I think you can use these ideas, um, you know, if you're in any program, if you're just doing it yourself or you're looking for some kind of um, 
some kind of other method of writing your memoir. Of course, as you all know, everything, everybody practically is writing a memoir these days. Michelle Obama, uh, we have also, uh, I mean, I'm not denigrating this. She's written a wonderful book, but there's so many um, stories about people's paths in life. And if you're famous, it really helps to sell. But in any case, um, you may just want to write just because it's a wonderful thing you like to do and you're capturing your own past. Okay, so first, I would say write what attracts you. Um, maybe there's a theme in your life you already know about that you would like to write about. And so maybe, and maybe some of you are already writing journals. Great, that's a great start. Um, but ge generally, journals are a collection of facts. And what you're gonna be working towards is looking at some of the major themes of your life. And that isn't going to come, maybe you already know those, but I think writing about your life in a series of, of uh, essays and chapters really helps clarify those for, your, for you. So, and then form an intention. Who are you writing for? Is it for your granddaughter? Is it for you? Is it for um, a specific group that might like to hear your experiences, like the Burlingame Historical Society? Um, and then can you give yourself a deadline? We've talked about that in various ways. That's so important. And then one of the first um, prompts that we've given, and I think it's a good one, no matter how you're approaching this to, is to lift, is to list some decision points and points of change um, in your life and just record them. You're not gonna write about all of them, but some of them will call out to you to be written about then make sure you're focusing on people in your life, your mentors, your loved ones, and your tormentors. We all know they're there. So try to bring them to life by adding dialogue, physical description. And the interesting thing to me is that when you're writing about um, a person or as in number five, thing, an object, sometimes it's, it's hard to, at first to pull in those memories, but the more you focus, the more you try to perhaps add dialogue, which may not actually be real, but you imagine it, it stimulates your memories. Um, one of the exercises we have is to draw your bedroom as a child. And it's amazing what people will remember after when they start doing that, um, what, they, what things they thought they'd forgotten. So number six, include difficult times as you write. You don't remember, you don't have any obligation to show it to anyone. You don't have to keep it but it's really, I think, a very good practice to write about the traumas and difficult times just for you. Then, of course, as you are interested in history, you know about research, you know about using archives, you know about using online resources to look at your family's past. And sometimes, if you're going to expand this to include other memories of other family members, you could use a tape. You know, we used to say use a tape recorder. Now we say use your phone. Go, um, hear some, um, stimulate some conversations with a parent, with uh, somebody your own age who is in your family and remembers things you might not. I think it's a very valuable resource. And then as you're going along writing this story, um, you'll find that you probably have, you will have chapters or collections of pages which are about a particular incident or a theme. Try to create a story arc. That's just to interest you and to interest your readers. That means that you'll have a beginning of perhaps a situation. Maybe you're going to write about what it was like to be in seventh grade. Okay, what are the incidents you're going to collect um, around that time period? And then have some kind of resolution, if you can come to it, at the end of this chapter. And it's, it's for your interest, because can you really pull things together? Are there some conclusions you can make? about what happened to you at that particular time. Another thing is to keep your audience in mind. You know, when you think about vocabulary, when you think about references, if you're writing about Roosevelt, are you writing this for your granddaughter? Does she know who Roosevelt is clearly? Do you need to sort of explain? Um, and I noticed in one of the earlier selections, McAdam was explained what McAdamizing a road was because most of us wouldn't have known and that was great. That, that the writer or the reader in this case um, kept us in mind. So number 11, I think is an ideal um, pr procedure if you can do it. Find a writing buddy, somebody you can read your writing to. Um, 
And it, one of the keys is regularly. So the hardest part of, of this task is getting yourself to write. You wanna make it a routine. You know, I was just in a writing class and the teacher said, you know, you've got to write absolutely every day. And then he said, well, okay, you could write just once a week. So the idea is, you know, um, you wanna incorporate it into your life, at least for this project. And then um, review and edit would be the last step. Of course, that's down the line. Um, and somebody asked me before uh, we, I started, what's in, what makes it good? I think, um, that is something that's very subjective because if you're talking about things that are important to you and you've successfully articulated them for yourself, that's the most important thing. But you want to include the feelings about your events, about the people in your life. I think that's the big distinction between just a list of facts. And we heard a lot of facts today, which were great and some feeling. But if you're gonna talk about, you know, what it was like when your brother went to war, you're not just going to list a few facts. You're going to put your heart into it or how it was when you met your spouse or when you divorced your spouse or whatever. Um, your feelings about it, your perspective are yours. And that's what's really valuable, uh, valuable about this. And then another thing is including as much detail. But from what I've heard today, detail is, is something that's part of what you like to do. Think about um, that makes it real for you and for the reader. And then um, a good resource is this particular book, Writing Your Legacy, because it's for people who are doing their autobiographies on their own. I mean, it does suggest collaborating with others during it, but, you know, it gives lots of pointers, lots of resources, lots of really great ideas. So um, anyway, that's kind of my list of hints. And if you'd like to have a copy, I'm sure we can get that to you. Um, I was going to also screen share a list of um, books, which of course you're not gonna, my husband said, what are you gonna give them? Are they supposed to t write those titles down? No, I just thought you'd get some idea of some of the books out there and you've probably already seen a number of them, but um, James Barron wrote this book, Telling the Stories of Life Through Guided Autobiography, which is kind of the, the basic of the Guided Autobiography program. But there are a lot of other books um, where people have taught basically the same idea of going through your life by themes or particular aspects like writing voice. That's pretty, that's a little more sophisticated that you maybe than you want to get probably at the beginning, but, you know, creating your own voice in your writing um, and changing it depending on uh, the circumstance or what your goal is. Anyway, um, those are just a few of them. And, and the uh, website guidedautobiography.com is the one that James Barron's group created and it has pe includes people and information from all over the world in it. So it's a good resource too, just to go to to see what's out there. So um, I hope that gives you some idea of the possibilities and probably a lot of you have read memoirs and autobiographies already because they're such a popular form. It's as if, you know, we, we need better narratives to, for our world these days. We don't just need Instagram and emails and text. We need stories with threads through them. We need the persistence of memory. So thanks. These are, um, th this is wonderful. I really appreciate super tips and everything. Did you mention you, are you still teaching um, at, at various libraries or? And if so, could you give the information? Yes, um, I'm, I'm leading a couple of groups at the Foster City Library where I've been for several years. It's really been wonderful. And I have to say, I think it's really bloomed on Zoom because we have people from all over, well, Northern California mostly, and they wouldn't drive there otherwise. And then I'm also, and those um, classes, and I should have brought the link, but there are classes starting again in January what I have is an introduction class where people who haven't done it before and they don't know each other, they come together and kind of get into the process. And then there's another class that's continuing. And the way it works is you're in, the, in a larger class and then we break up into small groups. So when you're reading what you've written, you don't have to read to 12 or 15 or 20 people, you read to four or five other people. So it's not nearly as, as intimidating. And then also um, I'm leading um, a writing, 
group at Mercy Center, and that will be starting again in January with kind of beginning classes, but that's um, through their website, and that's not free. There's a small fee, but everybody's welcome, of course, to that. Oh, and I can send you the, that ad address. Just, I mean, it was sort of silly of me not to have it in writing, but I can send it, either one of those. This is really great. Um, so is there anybody from our group or from the public who would like to ask Liz a particular question? I'd like to know, Liz, uh, this is Joanne Garrison speaking. I'd like to know if, um, if there is any particular reason or something that prompted you to get involved with this. Well, uh, let's see. About eight years ago, I just saw um, a, a note about a class that was being taught in Berkeley about um, writing your autobiography. And I'd, been, I'd taught English. You know, I'd been doing some writing for freelance articles, which I really enjoyed, but this looked like an interesting idea and it turned out to be wonderful um, because the group, uh, we had, I think we had eight sessions and members of that group have stayed together without the leader. We've just done it ourselves ever since. So we meet every month and we write whatever the heck we want. The important thing is to write. So anyway, I'm just, and then the other thing is I'm really fascinated when I've been working in communications with the sisters. I'm fascinated with people's life stories. So it's great. I get to hear so many stories. People approach them so differently. They have such different experiences. Some of them are very painful and that's hard for all of us. And you know, you wish you could patch things up for them. But anyway, I think the other idea is that in the telling, it's really, a, there's really healing in that. So I've, I've really enjoyed that. That's interesting because I, I thought you were going to say that you, you started because you were doing this for a, a grandchild or something. I, I thought perhaps most people would be interested in creating a legacy for their family members, but it sounds like you love to write. I do, but I also am putting it together finally, 10 essays, just 10, you know, and publishing on one on demand. Um, and that's kind of been fun because I have to keep thinking about my audience. Do those grandkids really want to know about, you know, whatever? <laughs> and and uh, so I, I think it is. It, it's also important, but that hasn't been my main motivator. You know, the most fun thing that I've done, I think, in Burlingame, was transcribing all the meetings from 1975, the inception of the Historical Society. Somehow I got roped into doing that. And thank heavens that Martha May was able to go through, correct my spelling, correct all the names that I didn't hear well. But it was so much fun listening to people's oral histories and, and how the meetings got started and, and all the speakers and these oral histories have been absolutely delightful. I found myself, and it would take like eight hours to transcribe one of them, uh, each one. And, and I would find myself just fascinated and laughing and I, I had a wonderful time doing those. So I, you know, I thank in my heart all the people who gave oral histories to the historical society. They don't know what a what a lovely thing that they have done. That sounds wonderful, Bobby. And you know, Bobby, um, Mark, uh, because uh, Kathy is leaving. Mark um, is starting these podcasts that we're going to hear more about, but. Um, so we are continuing the um, tradition, absolutely. I just need to find a, another transcriber besides me. I'm not good at it. So anyway, is there is is anyone else have a um, question for Liz or comment? Some of you might have to unmute if, if for us to hear you. But he's actually started writing about their lives one chapter or four chapters or just thinking about it. What well, Mark, Mark, your your history was very personal. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that was really a biography. Yes. 
Yeah. Um, you know, I kind of write every day a journal, but most of the time it's just a, a rehash of maybe what happened yesterday with sometimes some other thoughts that, why did I do that? You know what I mean? Or why did I get pissed off? Or, you know, I question myself a lot. So, uh, but I do enjoy it. And it's, it's pretty much, I've been doing it for seven years uh, I, because somebody once said to me, Mark, you know so much about the grocery business. Why don't you write a, write a manual? Well, I started to write a manual, but then it just went into my own. You know what I mean? And, and, but I, I do enjoy it. Short paragraph every day start the day with it. It feels good. And uh, yeah, so that's what I've been doing. Anyway, I hope to enjoy these podcasts and working with my videographer, the great Ray Tyler is going to be great. It was a lot of fun going, going forward. So uh, good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Ray's, I think Ray's listening or he was, he was yep. listening. So yep. it's super. There he is. Yeah. So um this is great, and I um, we're we are going to post this on our website. Um, if Russ will do that for us, hopefully, and because um, I think that we've all learned a lot of great tips from Liz, and I'll do my best. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, well, I guess we'll just close it out then, if if there's nothing else. And I want to thank everybody for the readers and the commenters, and of course Liz for participating it it was so interesting and um if if we need some materials from you liz of, of what you had online maybe you can uh -huh. send to joanne and we can somehow post those that's okay great super all right then um thank you everybody and uh appreciate it bye thanks bye. everyone thank, thank you, you. thank great. you great.